If you're looking for inspiration for mental resilience, I am not it. I've run nine ultra marathons and I've DNF twice. I quit twice. That's not a good track record. I believe the voices in my head and I gave in to them. I am not David Goggins, but maybe that is okay. Ultra distance running teaches you about your mind, the good and the bad. I'm trying to improve the part of me that gives in to the voices and there is no other way to do that than to get to the place where the voices get loud. To stoke the shadow within and to make the voices rise up, this week I did a backyard ultra. A 4.17 mile loop on the hour every hour. There is no finish line. The only two ways you can finish are to quit or to get timed out. I came here with one rule, don't quit. Ultra marathons are a curious thing. We stand there on the start line feeling nervous, but the pain won't come until hours later. What are we nervous about in that moment? We have a few hours of blissful slow running ahead of us. In a backyard, you get to chat to all the other people and there's a real camaraderie to the event. The first few loops, yards they call them, are nice and easy. A four mile loop done in around 50 minutes feels very relaxed and gives you time to rest and reset. There was nothing particularly remarkable about the format until loop eight for me. This is the loop in which you cover 50k, the rain up pouring down and it's starting to feel like you've covered an ultra distance because, well, you have. This is where the voices start. They're quiet at first, logical, not too crazy. Remember that niggle, the one you can feel in your foot, you don't want to make that worse, it will ruin your training for weeks. Is this a good idea? Thoughts like that start to infiltrate your mind. Covered 20 miles so far. And this is where already little voices in the back of my mind starting to question how I'm feeling, and I'm feeling fine. So I'm just talking to those voices. I know they're there to help me, but I don't have to listen to them. David Goggins calls this voice the governor. I think he's personifying Tim Noakes' central governor theory. This is the theory that states when our brain perceives a risk to our body, it will create phantom thoughts and symptoms to change our behavior. When we feel these pains, and importantly, when we create a narrative around these pains, it makes us more likely to change our behavior and to stop what we're doing. Our brain is a survival machine and it will try and keep us in our comfort zone. It doesn't want us to do hard things because this may lead to harm. Personally, I don't call this voice the governor. I prefer to steal from Stephen Pressfield's book, The War of Art, and I call it The Resistance. The Resistance is that dark force that has infiltrated your spirit and prevents you from achieving your goals. The Resistance presents itself in all aspects of your life, particularly when things get hard or you are closest to achieving what you want. But at first, the voices are quiet, almost imperceptible. It's easy to think that when you've done something hard once, you've made it, you're tough. But in my experience, that's not true. Assuming this will actually increase your risk of failure. Underestimate each new challenge at your peril. You need to renew your license. The more you do it, the better you get at pushing on. Goggins calls this callousing the mind, but you are never immune to the voices winning. This arrogance, assuming I was already tough, definitely contributed to my last DNF. The previous race I did before that was tough. My first 100 miler through the night in gale force weather, I thought I'd cracked it. It was an arrogance that made me think I would know what to do when the race got hard. I was lazy with my planning, lazy with my mind in the race. And when it inevitably got hard, I took the easy option out. Goggins has what he calls the one second rule. It doesn't matter how much time you put into your training, how much time you put into the race. The only second that matters is the second you quit. Trust me on this, the pain you feel from quitting when you know you could have gone on is so much worse than the pain you felt in the race. That one second really is all that matters. You need to do everything in your power not to give in to the resistance. But how do you do that? Well, first, you problem solve. Courtney DeWalter says that there is a direct correlation between how good you are as an ultra runner and how good you are at solving problems. Over a long period of time in a race, you will always encounter problems. Expect the unexpected. Things that have caught me off guard before, which I didn't know how to deal with, are feeling fatigued way earlier in the race than I expected, having gut issues, dealing with extreme heat, not knowing how to eat in the night time when my gut felt like it had shut down. These are all things that threw me massive curveballs the first time I encountered them, but I'm building a library of how to fix them. Fixing problems is empowering, and a bizarre rule of ultra running is that it never always gets worse. Sometimes it feels like it always gets worse, but just focus on fixing one small thing and the tide can start to turn. For the first time in this race, I tried speaking to the resistance out loud. 
As nighttime fell, the voice was getting loud. The boardroom of my mind was becoming loud and brash with the voices from the resistance and they were bullying my true self to be a quiet, timid voice in the back. As the resistance was telling me that I should stop and the niggle is getting worse, I'm feeling really tired, this sucks, you're never doing an ultra ever again, I started talking out loud. No, that is not the story. That is not me. I am the story. I am not going to quit. I can push. I would notice things like, I did that mile pretty fast. And I would say, you did that mile pretty fast. See, you can run. That biscuit tasted good. Your gut is fine. You are fine. You've got this. The resistance isn't real, but it uses story to make it seem real. I tried to write a new story. The sound of my own voice reinforced that I felt okay. In that moment, I was okay. Pay attention. The resistance makes its story in the future, not the present. That niggle will mean that you can't train in the future. Your tiredness will mean you can't work next week. Everything is based in the future. The real you needs to focus on the present. It is never as bad as you think. Some people embrace the pain, they go into it. This is where Courtney DeWalser's pain cave comes from. She builds the cave in her mind, chiseling into each new pain, gradually building tunnels into her mind cave. This is an example of visualization and it works for her. I prefer a classic mindfulness approach myself, just bringing my mind back to the present. My favorite moment of the race was in the night. I was at the back end of the course, no other runners were around. I checked the ground for the next 50 yards ahead of me and I turned off my head torch, running, looking up at the stars. There was a wonderful juxtaposition between the struggle of the race, the pain in my body and the beauty of nature. Everything hurt, but I felt very alive. In Steve Magnus' book, Do Hard Things, he notes that there is no one best strategy. In fact, the top athletes seem to be very good at switching strategies. Sometimes they need to shout at themselves, sometimes they need a visualization, sometimes they need to be calm and present. The ability to use multiple mind strategies seems to be a feature of the top people in sport. Try different approaches and see what works for you. I tried my best in this race. I worked my hardest to get back in time for another loop. And if I was back in time, I turned around and I went again. And that's all I asked of myself. And that's what I did. Eventually, I fell off a cliff and my leg stops working. I couldn't make it back in time and my race was over. But that's okay. You feel okay when you know you tried your best. It hurts so much when you quit knowing you had more in the tank. People always try and make you feel better when things don't go your way and they say things like, oh, you did so well, I couldn't run that far. But this doesn't make you feel better because there is only one person who knows the truth and that's you. In my two DNFs, I knew I could have done better and that hurts. There comes a time where we ask ourselves why we do these things and you have to know the answer to that. Having clarity on it will help you push on when things get tough. It will be different for each of us, of course, but for me, I think I'm doing it for some sort of self-discovery. I'm discovering what my body is capable of, where my mind goes, and I would go as far to say that I'm learning about my spirit. I am not David Goggins, but I'm on a journey, and that is okay. Oh, do I do this first? Yeah. That's it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like the softest screws in the loud it sounds. Oh, yeah. oh, I see. In the cup. In the cup. Thank you. Well done, uh, thanks so much. Thank well you. Done. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Thanks so much, guys. That's Thank right. you. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thanks, guys. <laughs>